Jackie Snell's podcast. And we're recording this podcast on January 25th, somewhere on North Doheny Drive, just below Sunset Boulevard. First of all, um, as I begin this section of the podcast, uh, I want to say something. I like Christopher Nolan's Oppenheimer. I was really, really impressed with it on a second viewing. I get it now. I get it. My mind was changed. This happens. Not a lot, but it happens. Uh, For some reasons, I resisted the movie when it opened last summer uh, to a glorious critical reaction and became a box office blockbuster with immediate bets that it would sweep the Oscars the following year. I thought somewhat sourly, yeah, that's probably true, and why not give Christopher Nolan an Oscar, even though Oppenheimer, on that first viewing, left me cold. I was so primed for it, even though it's not my kind of movie. A studio-approved historical biopic, a prestige costume drama, a period piece about something very, very important, a movie about the hazards of being a genius. Okay, well, but it's Nolan, so I was pumped. And yes, even after Tenet, I was pumped. And it couldn't be as dull as Ron Howard's A Beautiful Mind. I avoided the cinemas that the first week Oppenheimer opened, mostly because every time I checked for seats online, the damn thing was sold out in every single theater it was playing at those weeks in uh, July and early August. And always at the dozen or so theaters it was playing at in the AMC Century City Westfield Mall. The other dozen theaters at that mall were playing Barbie. More on that movie later. So I noticed one day that I didn't have to see Oppenheimer at the Century City Mall. It was, in fact, playing at the Village Theater in Westwood. A matinee at, I think, 1 o'clock on a Tuesday. Perfect. I knew the theater would be empty because the village almost always is empty, no matter what big hit is playing there. It's the movie theater equivalent of a museum, a protected historical monument, a landmark built in 1930 with 1,400 seats and a 70 millimeter screen and one of the best sound systems in any theater in L.A. Yes, it has a bare-bones concession stand, and the bathrooms have never been updated, and yet that's part of its charm. And there are at most, I think, usually 10 to 12 minutes of trailers compared to the nearly 30 minutes of ads and trailers at the AMC. If a movie is playing at The Village, even something I won't like, I might be tempted to go just because it's at The Village. I think listeners know by now uh, that I really like The Village. Uh, One of the only, if not the only, I think, standalone theater that plays first-run movies in L.A. Uh, The Cinerama Dome still has not reopened yet, but... um, Oh, wait, there is the Chinese, but um, I guess I avoid that because of how horrendous the parking situation is. Um, I am a Christopher Nolan fan, not a fanboy but simply a regular fan, even if some of his movies have left me scratching my head as I walked out, even after being thrilled. Uh, Inception and Interstellar are prime examples of this, one I liked less than the other. And then being thrilled by his overall sense of spectacle, mixed with, at times, a daring use of narrative. See how carefully composed the mosaics of Dunkirk and Oppenheimer actually are. And he's mastered a new kind of screen language, constantly keeping the editing rhythm paired with an almost continuous score that gives his movies a propulsive energy, a momentum that sometimes you're aware they don't always merit, the style at odds with certain scenes we're watching. No one who also writes his scripts, um, the only one he didn't, was Insomnia from 2002, uh, a remake of a Norwegian thriller starring Al Pacino and Robin Williams, thinks big and is a better director than he is a writer. Often he writes with his brother Jonathan, and sometimes you wish there was another writer in the room. He's good, and he always manages to bring an unusual and often surprising structure to a picture. And of course, there's his technique combined with an almost immaculate classicism 
that should be the envy of every filmmaker out there working today and taught in film schools. But he can be an overly familiar, uh, perfunctory dramatist within individual scenes and with a lot of his dialogue. Um, I'm not sure he can make a comedy. Humor is not on Nolan's checklist. He makes up with his minor flaws as a screenwriter, and Oppenheimer is his best script since The Dark Knight, uh, or shrouds them with pure movie-making bravura. Like Brian De Palma, he's able to move past the most cliched scenes with his filmmaking powers. But unlike De Palma, Nolan is a square, a good boy. He doesn't want to offend. And this can be a limitation for him as an artist. Oppenheimer is his first R-rated movie since Insomnia, but except for flashes of female nudity and an F-word or two, uh, there's no violence or even a drop of blood in its entire 180-minute running time. The fact that Oppenheimer isn't a PG-13 movie will strike some as mildly ridiculous, but the R rating did confirm for a large part of the adult audience, I guess, that Oppenheimer was a movie for adults. A serious movie. A big serious movie told on a grand scale for adults. And maybe Nolan threw in that nudity because he wanted the R rating, the R rating giving Oppenheimer a seriousness that maybe the PG-13 wouldn't have. Oppenheimer perhaps proved that an audience was starved for this, or maybe they were just starved for a new Nolan flick. Maybe that was me as well. Now, I'm not sure about big, serious studio movies. They're mostly Oscar bait drag, but this was Nolan. And he doesn't make those kinds of movies. And maybe this is why I was surprised by the fact I was blinded by this movie's very real skill when I watched it for the first time on the big screen and was just simply bored silly. Now, I'm not a fan of Memento or Nolan's debut following. Uh, I tried watching both again this past year. Not for me. Uh, I liked Insomnia a lot better, but uh, The Prestige and Inception... Didn't particularly blow me away, though they were obviously well-made, uh, even clever films. And maybe if I'd seen Tenet in a theater, I wouldn't have been um, as dismissive of it, even though I enjoyed the absurdity of its plot. But they're all watchable. And Nolan paces every movie he makes like a thriller. That helps a lot. Um, the Batman trilogy, especially his masterpiece, The Dark Knight, in between um, Batman Begins and The Dark Knight Rises are what excited me most about Nolan. The seriousness and gravitas and ideas he has melded into these popcorn superhero movies was a dramatic and invigorating and revelatory blast. And I thought he handled the scope and complexity of Interstellar beautifully and Dunkirk was an irresistible World War II movie. Simple, rousing, moving, and a grand piece of showmanship. The excitement of Oppenheimer seems to be attached to two things for me. It was a new Christopher Nolan movie, um, probably the last of the marquee directors around, meaning people will go to a movie if it's directed by him. Uh, Tarantino is probably the only other one left. Spielberg, as we have seen in his last two flops, is not. Scorsese never was. He's had so many more flops than his. And the fact that I like the audiences, seemed starved for a big-budget studio R-rated adult drama was also part of my pre-release excitement. That was, of course, a movie directed by Christopher Nolan. Let's not forget that. So when I went to the Village Theater, I was ready, excited. The reviews had been great. The box office phenomenal. It was going to win Oscars for Nolan and for Best Picture. This was already being prophesized by people at advanced screenings. The trailer looked grand. I was ready. As I've said, The Village never has that many trailers, and there were uh, maybe 40 people scattered about the massive auditorium. The most I'd seen since either um, Top Gun Maverick or the last Bond movie, um, but still a fraction, just a small fraction of what the theater could hold. Okay, so what I began watching seemed to me a fairly conventional movie about a misunderstood genius and also, oh no, a kind of courtroom drama. And so I settled in and concentrated on the movie, but it just wasn't engaging me. 
It was just a lot of people rushing around or sitting in rooms, being interrogated, and a lot of talking, all of it seeming somewhat standard. Well done, but why was no one making this movie? I felt no urgency about this. It reeked of prestige. There were too many characters. I could understand what was going on, but then it started to get vaguely boring. The test explosion happens, and that was okay. And yet there was another hour left to go. And I realized that a villain now needed to be vanquished. I started stretching and then pacing the back of the movie theater, waiting for the movie to end. Uh, there was no one around me for at least 20 rows. I was in the very back of the theater, so I could pace and look at my phone without bothering anyone. And this talk fest was just driving me crazy. I found it so risible that no one thought we'd be interested, and yet so proudly presenting this. What were people talking about? Yes, Oppenheimer had a scope and a scale, and yet it was trapped in rooms with seams that seemed so obvious and clear-cut that they dithered into the air. What was going on with audiences who were going to, by the end of its worldwide theatrical run, help make this movie an unheard of billion dollars, making it the second highest grossing R-rated movie in American history, Joker being the highest grossing, and yes, at a very distant third, Deadpool 2. What had I missed? Why did I come out of the movie grumbling and disappointed? What did it all mean? Why were people getting excited by this movie? I felt left out of the excitement. I wasn't surprised that a few people agreed with me, but only a few. But a lot of people I know really liked the movie and were surprised I hadn't. But I just couldn't grasp their enthusiasm. I just thought Oppenheimer was kind of boring. And this was considered a hot take in the summer of 2023. I was a troll. It was based on a very popular biography published in 2005 that I've never read called American Prometheus by Kai Bird and Martin J. Sherman. And yes, it's about J. Robert Oppenheimer, the American theoretical physicist who helped create the atomic bomb in his role in the um, Manhattan Project, which was the project where the atomic bomb was created. And so the movie chronicles the career of Oppenheimer beginning when he was uh, a 22-year-old student at Cambridge, then moving to Berkeley in California where he uh, teaches quantum physics and marries Catherine, a biologist and an ex-communist played by Emily Blunt. Uh, the whole communist angle will come back to haunt Oppenheimer in its uh, final third. Uh, while also having an affair with Gene Tatlock, a troubled psychiatrist played by Florence Pugh. And in the bulk of the movie, he is recruited in 1942 by the U.S. Army to oversee the making of the atomic bomb in Los Alamos. Uh, there have been movies about this before, but none on this vast of an IMAX scale and a $100 million budget. Sam Mendes had been the first director interested in adapting the book, but could never figure it out as a movie and gave up. And for about 15 years, numerous filmmakers tried, including Oliver Stone, but ended up with nothing. But Chris Nolan had written a screenplay for Oppenheimer and was planning on making it his next film after Tenet with Warner Brothers, the studio he had been in a long-term professional relationship with. They had produced and released all of Nolan's films, but they had, according to an enraged and very public Nolan, betrayed him, bungled completely during the pandemic, the release of Tenet, which they put up to stream after releasing it in the few theaters that were actually open. Nolan wanted them to wait or just keep it in the few theaters that were open, but do not stream my movie yet. Warner Brothers refused. And so no one terminated his relationship with Warner Brothers and put the Oppenheimer script up for sale. And Universal won the bidding war. No one demanded the following from Universal, a production budget of $100 million, an advertising budget of $100 million, an exclusive theatrical window of 120 days, which means no streaming during that period. And he also negotiated 20% of the film's first dollar gross and a three-week period both 
before the movie opened and another three weeks after the movie opened where Universal could not release any other movies. The movie was shot from February to May in 2022 and opened in the famous Barbenheimer weekend in the summer of 2023. And we'll come back to that in a minute. Yes, Barbenheimer. Um, My main gripe on a first viewing was that the entire movie should have just been set at Los Alamos and we should have seen the bombings of Nagasaki and uh, Hiroshima. Uh, If anyone could have pulled this off, Nolan would be the filmmaker. This should have been the prolonged and horrific climax of the movie, and that didn't happen. Instead, Oppenheimer went in a more talky and cerebral direction, a more searching and intellectual direction. And I had been grumbling about this ever since last August. What's the point if we don't see the aftermath of the very thing half the movie had been devoted in showing its creation? Until I rewatched it last week on my Samsung TV alone in my bedroom from about three in the afternoon until just after six in the evening. I had a screener I got from uh, Universal uh, WGA screener, and um, I changed my mind. I actually thought it was a very good film. It wasn't a movie for me. It lacked humor and playfulness and was so serious about its intentions it felt rigged. It didn't really breathe. It was a true story. It had hit beats. It had to dole out information. Almost all the dialogue is uh, scientific and expository, but not bad. In fact, it's a really good script as far as biopics go. But no one has, as I've said, a kind of generic voice when it comes to scripts. And you could argue even a generic filmmaking style as well, but masterfully generic. And yet the scripts are not by any means structured generically. There's just a squareness to Oppenheimer's total smoothness, uh, a professionalism that sometimes puts me off and sometimes I can admire. Uh, but Oppenheimer could have been made by a mathematician. And there was that lack of playfulness that bothered me. Uh, Yorgos Lanthimos's um, Poor Things is more my kind of movie than Oppenheimer. But where was the playfulness in this subject matter anyway? And what I was expecting was based on my own rather naive expectations, I now think as I look back from a later date. No one had actually figured out how to tell this story in a way that made sense dramatically. I just wanted something else last August, but that was my problem. On that second viewing, my mind was changed. I have no idea why, none, it just happened. And Oppenheimer played so much better for me, was so much more absorbing and gripping on my TV rather than on that huge screen of the Village Theater. I was so much more aware of the exquisite cinematography, the brilliant editing, the gorgeous wall-to-wall score, all of which will probably win Oscars. And I was never bored once on this second viewing and everything fell into place. I now had nothing but total admiration for Nolan for pulling this difficult movie off, for making it so consistently entertaining. Now, I'm not saying I loved it. I am just saying I liked it. And I admired his ambitions and the way it was told uh, enormously. But admiring a movie enormously is not the same as loving a movie. The movie didn't move me emotionally, but I was moved by the craft. And I was moved by Nolan's, um, for lack of a better word, competence for laying this whole thing out. And also, especially for his casting. Killian Murphy, who has never really registered for me before, is marvelous in a recessive performance. He has no big showy scenes. He doesn't scream, blow up, emote. And yet, based on Murphy's alertness to the role, we feel everything in a close-up. His eyes, the quiet delivery of his lines, his rage and disappointment all conveyed without acting with a capital A. He inhabits this role. He lives in it. And he gives the film a gravity and an urgency that completely complements and heightens Nolan's gifts as a filmmaker. And Murphy has the added benefit of not being that well known enough to uh, be distracting, to be a movie star first and Oppenheimer second. Uh, And this isn't an actor's showpiece. It isn't a starry role. But Murphy keeps us glued. 
For many, I think he's a new face. And as often as I've seen him, this is the performance of a career. As is, I'm shocked to say, Robert Downey Jr. As Oppenheimer's friend, uh, or wannabe friend, and then nemesis who betrays Oppenheimer, Robert Strauss, um, uh, for reasons that are too subtly complicated to get into here. Um, the last time I saw Downey this good in something was in, um, yes, Less Than Zero, back in 1987. He had become, since then, I thought, an increasingly mannered young actor who never seemed to take anything seriously. He was uh, on his own a lot, always on, and lost in his own youthful shtick, which he kind of got by on, but he mugged an awful lot, and yet also seemed so uninterested, but always in a bravura way. And he was saved by a comedy or two, and he could salvage scenes with moments of his trademark intensity. I'm thinking of a couple of scenes in Shane Black's Kiss Kiss Bang Bang, and both uh, James Toback's Two Girls and a Guy, and um, Black and White. Uh, he also made the Guy Ritchie Sherlock Holmes movies watchable. I mean, I'll give him that. Uh, he was also really good in Wonder Boys, but he was still playing Downey more than he was playing that role. And I'd say the same thing about his performance in David Fincher's Zodiac. Solid, but it was Downey first. And the louche crime reporter fit his personality all too well. It was as if Downey was playing himself and not the self-destructive Paul Avery. And then Marvel swallowed him up when he starred in its first movie, Iron Man, uh, from 2008, where he played Tony Stark. He was both funny and an irritant in that film, but he gave it a pizzazz. He gave it a human face, a life. And he saved the movie with an improvised what-the-hell quality that was so at odds with the massiveness of the movie that this schism really popped with audiences and revitalized his career as well as the Marvel franchise. And so because of its success, he was trapped in 10 more Marvel films, though he had said on the record that he had no desire to waste his time and make serious indie movies no one wanted to see. That era for him was over. Downey seemed to not really care anymore, and the uh, dramatic projects he chose uh, while on break from his Marvel contract were dreadful. Uh, the Soloist from 2009, The Judge from 2014, and now that he was rich beyond anyone's fantasies, there was a kind of listlessness, a kind of I've got to get the damn job done quality that made the Marvel movies increasingly boring. Uh, and this was not Downey's fault. It seems to happen to anyone who has stayed in the Marvel universe too long. Now, in his late 50s, with Tony Stark dead, Downey gives the most restrained and subtle performance of his career. Yes, he has one little Oscar bait meltdown, but most of this performance is delivered with a subtlety that borders on grace. He underplays everything. He has to. His character's hiding something. And watching this performance for a first time, I was relieved and impressed that this role had turned him inside out. But I was so bored by a certain point and annoyed by the movie that the quality of this performance didn't register in any of the ways it did on a second viewing where, like Killian Murphy, Downey simply steps into the shoes of this man and finally gives a fully realized performance with no ego, no shtick. He is the villain of Oppenheimer, but a man who feels wronged. Um, you have to see the movie. I, I don't want to explain it here. And though the movie is a little too proud of itself when he gets his comeuppance, this is the only flash of the old Downey. Downey will be accepting his supporting actor Oscar in March at the Kodak. He's been nominated twice before, but this is his moment. And add in the fact that he's helped make the town that will be honoring him billions of dollars does not hurt his chances at all. And though I would prefer Ryan Gosling as Ken, uh, more on that later, to win Best Supporting Actor, I have no problems with Downey getting it this year, though I also hugely enjoyed Mark Ruffalo's out there slapstick performance as the hilarious fop lawyer in Poor Things almost as much as I enjoyed Gosling in Barbie. 
Emily Blunt transforms the role of the standby wife into a steely, unsentimental portrait of resolve. And Florence Pugh shows a side to her we've never seen, and I'm not talking about the nudity, we've seen that before, in which she's actually playing an adult for the first time, and she's very good. Uh, the rest of the impressive supporting cast is huge and includes Matt Damon, funny, on the verge of parody at times though, and it was so good to see Josh Hartnett back on the big screen in a substantial supporting role. He fits perfectly into the 1940s, 1950s time period, the all-American pragmatist who wants to save Oppenheimer from himself. Um, Casey Affleck has a good scene. Uh, Kenneth Branagh has one or two as Niels Bohr. Uh, Benny Safdie's in it. Jason Clark. Tom Conti as Albert Einstein. Dane DeHaan. And especially Alden Ehrenreich. More on him later. Uh, David Krumholtz and Matthew Modine and Rami Malek. Alex Wolf from Hereditary. And Michael Angarano, one of my favorite young actors who starred in the uh, TV series I'm Dying Up Here. James Remar, and in a wonderful scene, Gary Oldman as Harry S. Truman. This is a movie that is also free of contemporary ideology. This movie has zero to do with DEI. It's a historical movie about white 20th century exceptionalism, and unapologetically so. The movie has a confidence, a swagger, very few movies possess. It also has a moral quandary at its center that on a second viewing makes even more of an impact. Oppenheimer would make a very interesting and instructive double feature with Jonathan Glazer's The Zone of Interest. Two different situations, of course, but the same war. Uh, both movies about building weapons of mass death, the bland bureaucrat talk over coffee of revolving crematoriums in the zone of interest, the gung-ho scientist racing against time to build something that will end up killing hundreds of thousands in Oppenheimer. The screenplay leaps over all of the hurdles the material and this story has set up, and it's a miracle it's never didactic. It just flows effortlessly with information that in any other filmmaker's hand would feel overly expository and dead. And yet, no one paces the movie, as I've said, like a thriller, and it just never stops moving. At 53, uh, Nolan will be winning a couple of Oscars in March. Most certainly director and producer, along with his wife, Emma Thomas, who produces all of his movies for Best Picture and I think Best Screenplay, Best Adapted Screenplay, though there are pundits out here who insist Barbie is going to win Best Adapted Screenplay as a consolation prize. Uh, I love it, but I have my doubts, though there is uh, talk that this is the category where Barbie might beat out Oppenheimer. And though there are movies I liked more in 2023 than Oppenheimer, yes, Barbie was one of them, and Poor Things was the best movie I saw last year, I want Nolan and this picture to win. It's not a movie I love, but Nolan is a true believer in the spectacle of cinema. But so is Greta Gerwig, and so is Yorgos Lanthimos. Alexander Payne might not so much by comparison. And by that, I just don't mean the way he shoots the test blast. That's absolutely mind-blowing. But the way he shoots everything. And I think the reason I responded to it on a TV screen is that Oppenheimer is mostly an intimate drama and everything seems so loud and blown up in 70 millimeter, reducing the intimacy. The screen was too big. And I realized that Oppenheimer didn't really need to be shot in IMAX 65 to achieve its emotional effects. Despite its huge and somewhat starry cast, Chris Nolan is the real star of this movie. Martin Scorsese is an artist and our greatest living American filmmaker, whether you like his movies or don't. But no one is the best conventional craftsman in American movies. And that's, as they say, not nothing. Okay, on to the other most talked about movie of the year. And that is, of course, Greta Gerwig's Barbie, the year's biggest hit. I had no real interest in seeing Barbie when it 